Okay. Uh, let me welcome you all to our first panel, Epistemologies of Sao Paulo. I'm going to introduce um, the speakers. Um, Ayala Levy um, is a um, PhD candidate in the research department at the University of Chicago. Uh, and her paper is Toward the History of Cultural Spaces in the Self-Destructive City. Ayala, uh, she studies Latin American cities at the turn of the 20th century. Her research interests lies, lie in the intersection of the history of ideas, space, cultural policy, and the arts. During the 2011-2012 academic year, uh, she conducted dissertation research in Sao Paulo, uh, with the support of Mellon Graduate Fellowship for International Study. Her article presented at the EPHS um, Art and History uh, Symposium in Sao Paulo, uh, the Stages of a State, received be be Best Postgraduate Award, and it was accepted for publication at Planning Perspectives. Congratulations. Um, Sarah Townsend, oh, you. Should I present you all first? Sure. Okay. Sarah Townsend, uh, she, is, uh, she received her PhD at New York University in 2010, and she joined the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California, Santa Barbara, as a teaching fellow uh, for 2011-2013, and will begin as an assistant professor in the Department of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese at Pennsylvania State uh, University. She is the co-editor of Stages of Conflict, a critical anthology of Latin American theater and performance, and has published articles in journals such as Modernism, Modernity, and Revista Ibero-Americana. Um, Marcio C.V., um, he um, is a PhD candidate at New York um, University. Um, and he, um, his paper is The Making of Ibirapuera Park, Visions of the Modern and Cultured City in Post-War Sao Paulo. Uh, he was a program officer at Harvard University's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies uh, that he joined under the direction of Kenneth Maxwell. Um, previously, he was the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and finally, our fourth panelist, Josh Shake. Um, he is a PhD candidate at New York uh, University, too, right? Uh, oh my God, why did I put this? Anyway, <laughs> um, so, oh yeah, uh, in the Urban and Regional Planning Departments. You were right. Uh, his paper is Jamie Jacobs, Jamie Jacobs and Sao Paulo, Idea Flows, Urban Regeneration and Contextual Applicability. Um, his areas of interest include informal settlement upgrading, economic development, redevelopment planning in Central and South America. So here you are. So we can have Sara as the first presenter. Thank you. Great. Right, well, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Um, the title of my paper is Brazilian Modernismo and the Operatic Logic of Paulist Exceptionalism. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay. Great. Ensconced in the old center of Sao Paulo, the Teatro Municipal is an architectural embodiment of what Roberto Schwartz might call an idea fora do lugar, or an idea out of place. Nowadays, it stands engulfed by a sea of skyscrapers, but when it was first completed in 1911, this grand opera house towered over the surrounding landscape, an ostentatious anchor and auger of a vast wave of urban expansion spurred by the coffee boom. Built to accommodate European opera companies arriving on tour, at the time there was not a single standing company in Brazil, the theater would become a prime gathering spot for the coffee oligarchy and nascent industrial elite, as well as an imposing symbol of the city's rise to prominence on the world capitalist stage. The Teatro Municipal has hosted its share of divas and maestros, yet as any tourist guide worth its salt will note, there is a more paradoxical reason for its renown. It is the so-called birthplace of the Brazilian avant-garde. Over the course of a week in February 1922, the artists later known as modernistas gathered to proclaim their existence and overthrow the pasadistas of the ancien regime. 
Canonical narratives represent the Semana de Arte Moderna as a watershed in the quest for cultural autonomy, a performative rupture that broke with the colonial legacy of imitation and put the nation's artists on par with their European peers. But for scholars such as theater, such as myself, this story is complicated by a curious fact. Modernismo was born in a theater, yet it engendered no new theater of its own. The event included exhibitions of new paintings, sculpture, poetry, prose, music, and dance, yet the absence of modernista theater was only underscored by its setting on a stage built for an art that was irrevocably tied to the gilded, gilded age of the European bourgeoisie. In this paper, I show how the, how the modernistas drew on the idiom of opera in tying their call for cultural autonomy to Sao Paulo's emergence as the economic vanguard of Brazil. As Theodore Adorno once noted, the art of opera has always fostered attachments to outmoded ways of life. While its rise in the 17th century coincided with the ascendancy of the bourgeoisie, what it staged were feudal relations already on their way to becoming obsolete. Opera fueled a retrospective need for social structures no longer on the cusp of capitalist production and development, which was in turn linked to a desire for those on its cultural and geographical periphery people who are of foreign blood or are otherwise outside, in the words of Adorno. In what follows, I draw a connection between the modernista's operatic attachments and a racialized discourse of regional exceptionalism that traced the roots of Sao Paulo's recent boom to its history as a colonial frontier. Pulling back on the futuristic impulse endemic to the idea of the avant-garde, I show how their retrospective need for this imported art can offer insight into the contradictions of Brazil's uneven development during what is often referred to as its export age. By the end of the First World War, it is often said, opera had already become what Adorno describes as peripheral and indifferent, reified and rendered passé by the new media of mass culture, such as film. And yet the specter of opera haunts the discourse and praxis of the avant-garde, despite its ostensible attempt to destroy all vestiges of the bourgeois stage. In Brazil, the intimate ties between the vanguard and a peripheral outmoded art were all the more vexed given the country's own peripheral um, position, often regarded as economically and culturally backward and behind. Financial backing for the Semana, Semana Giacci Moderna came not from the incipient industrial class, but from the landed coffee elite. Yet in the press, supporters billed the festival as proof of Sao Paulo's unique character as a place of self-made men, the chosen destination of intrepid immigrants dating back to the days of the heroic Banderanchis, the colonial scouts who prospected for minerals in the unsettled interior and captured indigenous people to be sold as slaves. The artistic vanguard was thus seen as the cultural counterpart of a uniquely aggressive form of entrepreneurial capitalism that had its roots in Sao Paulo's origins as a colonial frontier, a site of triumph over more primitive peoples, as well as a site of primitive accumulation. What set a per such a perspective managed to evade was the fact that the recent economic expansion and the increasing integration of, um, into global capitalist networks had been driven by the export boom in primary commodities and ostensibly non-modern modes of production. It is in the modernista's own allusions to the high art of opera where the pull of the so-called primitive and past reappears. On the second day of the Semana Giacci Moderna, the writer Menotti del Piccia concluded his opening speech with an allegorical coda about an unheard of thing, a coisa inaudita, seen only a few months earlier on the very stage where he stood. The fourth act of Arrigo Boito's Mephistopheles, an opera said to have sparked a riot at its debut at La Scala in 1868 over its obvious affinities with the mythic music dramas of Wagner. Del Pichu does not cite this detail, but he leaves no doubt as to his opinion of the performance, depicting the grand finale as a comparseria ridicula, a preposterous hodgepodge of Faust, ancient Greece, and Roman gods. Heaping scorn on the opera's eclectic aesthetic in blithe disregard for chronology, he lambasts the artificiality of the mise-en-scene um, and portrays Boito's review of ready-made gods, or deosis de fancaria, as an accidental allegory of the decline of the aura of art. The regal crowns on the heads of the gods were cobbled together out of cans, he says, the mighty sword of Mars was made of tin, and the gold adorning their togas, togas was flimsy painted paper. Grand opera musters all of its performative power to create a sense of ritualistic presence, yet this is opera designed for reproducibility, 
to borrow a term from Walter Benjamin, not only because so many of its constituent parts are mass produced, but because it is opera for export, an Italian company playing another gig on the South American circuit. A symbol of the Parnassian decadence and cultural dependency the vanguard is out to overturn, it simultaneously evokes the looming threat of mass culture that Del Piche implies must be kept at bay. And yet he cannot dispense with opera entirely. Whereas his par parable begins by conjuring a prior performance of an operatic scene, it ends with a gesture of abstraction, divesting opera of its ties to the physical stage in order to reclaim it as an ideal. In an allusion to the protagonist of his own novel, Juca Mulato, Del Piche evokes un cowboy nacional, who in the Rio Prieto region of São Paulo state, reproduces the equestrian odyssey of Orlando Furioso, just as the famed a aviator Edu Chavez uh, reproduces with Paulista audacity the dream of Icarus. But the star with top billing is the city of Sao Paulo itself, by his reckoning a modern industrial polis composed of neatly defined classes and corporatist groups. The worker claiming his rights shares a stage with the bourgeois defending his coffer, functionaries gliding on the tracks of regulations, the industrialist fighting the struggle of competition, and even woman breaking the bonds of her age-old slavery. Nothing is awry in this fully rationalized system. Everyone sings his or her designated part. African slavery has left no legacy, clientelism has ceded to free competition, and we get no glimpse of any coffee planters or pickers, the agricultural basis of the export economy on which Sao Paulo's industrial growth hinged. For Menotti del Piccia, liberal ideas are not out of place in, in Brazil. The country can successfully replicate the classic stages of capitalist de development, just as it can reproduce its classic myths, and the role of the avant-garde is to consecrate its golden age. And so he concludes by presenting the review of artists who will illustrate his words and banish the specter of Mephistopheles' tawdry gods by turning the stage into the site of avant-garde music, dance, poetry, and prose, all of the old arts except theater. Del Piccio's vision of Sao Paulo as a heroically operatic metropolis no doubt appealed to the festival's financial backers, but not all of the participants betrayed such an utter lack of irony. Oswald Giandraggi was more tied to the money than most. It may have been due in part to him that the audience on opening night included Washington Luis, the state governor and future president of Brazil, who was an old family friend. Perhaps this is why Oswald felt at liberty to turn his scathing humor on one of the local gods, the only Brazilian composer who appeared alongside Verdi, Wagner, Bellini, etc., in the list of names inscribed above the stage of the Teatro Municipal. There's no exact record of, or there's no record of the exact words Oswald uttered on stage, but they were apparently of the same tenor as a newspaper column he had written not long before. I'll read it in Portuguese since the language is, as usual, very interesting. Uh, Carlos Gomes é horrível. Todos nós o sentimos desde pequeninos, mas como se trata de uma glória da família, engolimos a cantarolice toda do Guarani e do Chiavo, inexpressiva, postiça, nefanda. E quando nos falam nos absorventes de gênio do Campin, uh, de Campinas, temos um sorriso de alçapão, uh, assim como quem diz, é verdade, antes não tivesse escrito nada, um talento. Leave it to Oswald to poke his finger in the wound. Gomez's operas, he suggests, do act as a kind of cultural glue, but not because the music evokes genuine emotion or because anyone actually believes the trite stories are good. Au, au contraire, the family's pride and joy is also its secret shame. Conventional opera, he specifies Italian opera, had its era of legitimate affirmation, but that moment was long past when Gomez came along and hitched his wagon to the lackluster Italians rather than following the lead of Wagner, whose revolution of Voit Bayreuth joined poetry and drama to music, and in doing so, brought to the theater an unknown vigor and corrected it, intellectualized it. The medieval knights of Tristan and Isolde, and the Norse giants who lumber through Die Gotterdämmerung and Die Valkyr, make the Volkish spirit visible. In contrast, Carlos Gomez, whose indigenous operas debuted in Milan, succeeded in profoundly defaming his country, making it known via Indians wearing gourd-colored bathing suits and gaudy feather dusters on their heads, roaring indomitable strength on terrible stage sets. It's a quote from Oswald. Go Gomez gave audiences in Paris and Milan the spectacle of the exotic other, and its artificiality only makes visible a cultural and racial divide that is all too real. And yet Gomez is our man, un nosso homem, not despite but by virtue of his opera's egregious flaws. We swallowed it whole, we hum the discordant tune, we carry the contradiction within. 
The basis of our bond isn't our common identification with an exemplary scenario on stage, but our sense that what we hear and see is a sham, something nefando or abominable, unspeakable, morally wrong. Oswald exposes the lie at the core of high culture in Brazil, yet he also performs an ideological sleight of hand by projecting the guilt and shame of one class onto the country as a whole. And as is so often the case, he does so in order to justify his own national cure. His lampoon of Gomez is a long lead-in for a plug for um, Eto Villalobos and his Cancucus and Canquiquis to African dances for piano, who is said to be on par with Stravinsky and Italians such as Malipiero and Castelnuovo Tedesco, working in the same vein as experimental artists such as Jean, uh, Jean Cocteau. Villalobos is from Rio, no one is perfect, but Oswald confidently predicts, Sao Paulo is going to hear him, and since Sao Paulo is the city of miracles, heir to migrations and entradas, or, um, it is going to accept him. Funny how an article that begins by cutting Paulista pride to the quick ends up reaffirming the region's exceptional status, invoking Sao Paulo's violent history as evidence of its capacity to assimilate its others. Funny, too, how for all his differences with, with Menotti del Piccia, Oswald also solves the issue of opera as national embarrassment by alighting its theatrical component, which conscripts human beings as the material matter of representation. The terrible stage sets of Gomez's operatic allegories of racial miscegenation give way to Villa Lobos's African-inspired dances. Sao Paulo will hear his music, and if it resonates as an authentic expression, expression of Brazil, it is because it spares listeners the shameful sight of a white man in Indian drag. Whereas Wagner sto strove to stage the social totality by joining all the arts, the musical ingenue of modernismo eliminates all but the drama's oral trace. There can be no counterpart to Lohengrin and the Valkyries in a country imperfectly forged in the fires of conquest and slavery. But the Brazilian vanguard did have a Parsifal. In the months leading up to and following the week of modern art, the writer and music teacher Mario Giandaggi would gain a name among his fellow modernistas as the Brazilian Parsifal. A visibly mixed race and, it was often suggested, vaguely queer version of the hero who wanders the primeval forest searching for the Holy Grail in Wagner's opera of the same name. In an article titled Umeo Poeta Futurista, Oswald had lavished praise on his new friend, a livid and long, well-mannered Parsifal, while lauding the writer's forthcoming collection of poetry, Paulicea Desvairada, as expressing the daily formidable alteration of their very physiognomic grace of an uncontained or inconchida, absorbent, diluvial metropolis of new people. As in other evocations of Mario, there is no explicit mention of the poet's own not-quite-white physiognomy, um, though through the power of insinuation and illusion, he becomes emblematic of a city defined by its capacity to assimilate or absorb the old and new. Shy but also ostentatious, a man of humble origins whose very appearance recalls the primitive practice of slavery, um, yet also erudite and aristocratic, operatic, yet also avant-garde, Mario embodies the paradoxes of Brazilian moderni uh, modernization and emerges as the imaginary nexus between the vanguard and the city, the exceptional figure who substantiates their claim to symbolize an exceptional city, um, which paradoxically assumes the role of representing the nation as a whole. So then what did the Brazilian Parsifal say when he took the operatic stage? So far as the paltry record shows, he did not mention a word about opera at all. In fact, no one can say for sure what he said. On the afternoon of the second day, he was called on stage to recite several of his own poems, but he apparently rushed off when faced with catcalls from the crowd. A similar reaction is said to have greeted the speech he gave later that day from the stairs leading, from the lobby, um, leading up from the lobby. Twenty years later, in the context of another speech, Mario himself recalled the events. Oops, como tive coragem para participar daquela batalha? É certo que com minhas experiências artísticas muito que venho escandalizando a intelectualidade do meu país, porém expostas em livros e artigos, um, como que essas experiências não se realizam em anima nobil. Não estou de corpo presente, e isto abranda o choque da estupidez. Mas como tive coragem, uh, coragem para dizer versos diante de uma vaia tão bulhenta que eu não escutava no palco o, o que Paulo Prado me gritava da primeira filha das poltronas como pude fazer uma conferência sobre artes plásticas na escadaria do teatro, cercado de anônimos que me caçoavam e ofendiam a Valer. 
Out of place on the operatic stage, this Brazilian Parsifal looks across the chasm to Paulo Prado, the coffee baron who a few years later would publish his famous Retatro do Brasil, where he attribu attributes the country's melancholic character to the avarice and extravagance of slavery and the shameful vice of our mestizo origins. Paulo presumably tries to offer Mario encouragement, but he fails because all the money in Sao Paulo can't silence the noise of the old order separating a not quite white intellectual from the rogue aristocrat whose money and prestige facilitate his appearance on the city's premier stage. Refusing the injunction to perform, Mario abandons the inner sanctum of representation in a move toward the expanding metropolis beyond the theater's doors. Though he doesn't leave to perform in the street, and what he reads isn't a manifesto, the favored genre of the futurist avant-garde. Instead, he delivers a lecture on art, a more scholarly, conventional genre, exposing himself to mockery in the lobby, ou entre lugar, or the space in between. Standing on the stairs above a vestibule adorned with Venetian murals of Wagner's operas, this peripheral figure becomes the protagonist of an um, impossible avant-garde drama, which is also a national opera that cannot be staged. 